Hello and welcome to Wineskins, a program that features the lives of the saints and reflections on the Sunday readings, along with information on a variety of topics and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm Father Jim Corda. Our program is brought to you through the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. Our interview segment today will feature Stan Boney from WKBN Channel 27 First News in Part 1 from our television series called Spotlight. We will also get a glimpse into the life and times of Saints Cyril and Methodius, along with reflections on the readings for this sixth Sunday in Ordinary Time. That and more on Wineskins. To tell us more about marriage and family life in the Diocese of Youngstown is Dave Schmidt. Today is World Marriage Day. World Marriage Day is promoted each year by Worldwide Marriage Encounter on the second Sunday of February and exists to honor husband and wife as the foundation of the family, the basic unit of society. It salutes the beauty of the couple's faithfulness, sacrifice, and joy in daily married life. But we live in an age of individualism and changing definitions of marriage. Amidst the confusion of what marriage is or is not, there are some fundamental truths contained in our Catholic understanding of marriage that are good for us to remember, regardless of whether we are just preparing for marriage or have been married for over 50 years. First of all, it's important to remember that marriage is not just our personal relationship or arrangement in life. Rather, marriage is a vocation from God. Marriage is a calling from God that helps reveal to us who God is and who God created us to be. The Bible tells us that God is love and we are created in the image and likeness of God. In other words, God created us out of love and made us for love. In marriage, husband and wife are called to love each other as God loves us. And just as God's love for us has been marked by covenants, solemn agreements, so too the husband and wife share a covenantal love through the vows that they share and are called to live out each and every day of their lives. Our vows call us to love and honor each other in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, just as God's love for us is unconditional. The venerable Archbishop Fulton Sheen once said that at a wedding, a husband and wife make promises to each other that only God can keep and that it takes three to make a marriage, a bride, a groom, and God. In other words, to have a successful marriage, we must recognize our need for God's help. Likewise, to be successful in marriage, we must also recognize our need for help from the surrounding community, including the church. While marriage is deeply personal, it is not exclusively private. If it were merely a private affair between two people, we wouldn't be inviting all kinds of people who are important to us, like family and friends, to our wedding day. When a couple goes to the church to be married, they are not simply renting a space that will look good in the wedding pictures, nor are they just contracting services from a man licensed to solemnize weddings. Rather, the couple is asking the church and the church's representative, the priest or deacon, to share with them one of the church's seven greatest treasures, namely a sacrament. We married couples need to keep in mind that marriage is every bit as much of a sacrament as his holy orders or the Eucharist, and that it is a unique way through which God shares his grace with us. This grace, imparted through the sacrament of marriage, has its impact not only on us as a couple, but affects all who witness the love that we seek to live out each and every day of our lives. Thus, marriage builds up the community of faith, the church, as well as contributing to the stability of society. Lastly, I think it wise for married couples to view marriage as a holy adventure of love, something that is more important than the attraction or love that brought us to our wedding day is our intention and resolve to grow in love and find new ways of loving each other despite whatever challenges life may throw at us. Like any journey or adventure, 
it is good to consult with learned guides and mentors. For couples approaching their wedding day, marriage preparation serves this purpose. And for veteran married couples, there are a myriad of resources available to help and strengthen their marriage, such as books at Catholic bookstores or programs like Marriage Encounter. The research done on marriage is impressive, and there are many tools to help couples on their journey. But none is more important than couples interacting with other couples who take seriously their faith and their marriages. On this World Marriage Day, may we commit ourselves anew to the sacrament of marriage and be of mutual support to fellow couples on the journey. For Wineskins, this is Dave Schmidt. St. Cyril and Methodius were brothers and apostles to the Slavic nation. To tell us more is Rachel Herbelich. She is from St. Mary and Joseph Church in Newton Falls. These two saints were proclaimed co-patrons of Europe, together with St. Benedict, by St. John Paul II on December 31, 1980. The feast itself is on the date of the death of Cyril, the blood brother of Methodius. They were born in Thessalonica, Greece, and became apostles to the Slav nations of Moravia, Bohemia, and Bulgaria. Their feast has been celebrated universally in the church since 1880. St. Cyril was ordained a priest at Constantinople and taught philosophy there. His older brother, Methodius, after being governor of a Slav province, became a monk. In 862, the Prince of Moravia asked for missionaries who could speak the language of his country. The two brothers, Cyril and Methodius, were selected for the task. They differed greatly from the Latin Rite missionaries from Germany because they were able to adapt to the people they were evangelizing. For example, they created a Slav alphabet and they translated the Bible and the liturgy into the Slav language. Hence, the characters were called Cyrillic. Cyril died in the year 869 and is buried in the Basilica of St. Clement in Rome. After being ordained a bishop, Methodius returned to the East as papal legate to the Slav nations. During the last four years of his life, he dedicated himself to the translation of the Bible and other works into Slavonic. He died in the year 885, and the funeral liturgy was conducted in Greek, Latin, and Slavonic rites. The first part of the opening prayer of the Mass recalls the great merit of the two brothers as missionaries who brought the light of the gospel to the Slavic nations. Those countries rightly consider Cyril and Methodius as their fathers in the Christian faith. By introducing new languages into the liturgy of the church, they revived the prodigy of the early church. The two missionaries not only made the church resplendent by their works of evangelization, but they are models for the adaption of the faith to various cultures. They understood the points of reference to the culture of the people, and they knew how to promote unity without imposing rigid uniformity. Because they laid the foundation for a truly Christian popular culture, Cyril and Methodius can also serve as reliable guides in the ecumenical movement. The prayer after communion invokes the Father of all nations who, through the one bread and the one spirit, has made us companions and heirs of the eternal banquet. We then ask that he will grant that all his children, united in the same faith, will be in full agreement in promoting justice and peace. All cultures of the Slavic nations owe their beginnings and development to St. Cyril and Methodius, whether it was the creation of their alphabet or the translation of the liturgical books into the language of the people. Ultimately, the work of these two co-patrons of Europe was an outstanding contribution to the common Christian foundation of Europe. For Wineskins, I'm Rachel Herbelich. Hello and welcome to Spotlight. I'm Father Jim Corda. Today we're going to talk with news veteran Stan Boney. Welcome to Spotlight. It's Thanks, nice to Father have you Gordon. on. Thank you very much. And uh, we know that you are with 27 First News, am, WKBN. Yes, yes. And many people, I'm sure, are very familiar with you. And I think for the folks that are with us, they'd like to get to know you a little bit better. So maybe we could begin by just you telling us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, where well, you're my from. My resume. Please. And we'll start with that. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm 59 years old. 
I was born and raised in Finlay, Ohio, which if you jump on Route 224 in, in, in the Boardman area, Boardman Canfield area, drive 170 miles west, you'll run right smack dab in the middle of downtown mm -hmm. Finley. 224 has been the connection of my life. They, they link okay. each town. I was born and raised there. My father, my brother, my sister, and uh, some of my family members still live there. Mm -hmm. And I go home quite often. My mother's now deceased, but my father is still around, so I go home to visit him quite often. Born and raised there, I went to high school there, Finley High School, graduated in 1975. And then I enrolled at Ohio University in Athens. Mm -hmm. I went there and I majored in broadcast journalism. Knew from a fairly early age that I wanted to get into TV news. Mm -hmm. I, I started thinking I wanted to be a sportscaster. When I went to OU, I was introduced to news. Mm -hmm. And when I graduated from OU in 1979, I had a background in both sports and news, which really was good for me. Mm -hmm. At that point, I got a job in a small radio station in Dayton, and I worked there for four mm -hmm. months. It was an all news and talk station, something like WKBN AM is mm -hmm. here in Youngstown. So I worked there for four months, and then the job opened up in Youngstown, and I came to Youngstown in October of 1979. This year will be my 38th year in October that I have been in Youngstown doing broadcasting. My first job was with WYTV Channel 33. I worked there for, I don't know, 35 some years, mm -hmm. and I did that for a long time. I, I did sports for a while. I reported the news for a while, but I think the longest thing I ever did at 33 is I was the weather guy, right. I was the meteorologist, right. and I think that's what a lot of people still remember me as. Yeah. And I did the weather for 33 for probably 30 years, maybe, or something mm -hmm. like that. And then when WYTV and WKBN merged, that was in December of 2007, I moved up to the WKBN building, but was still working for WYTV. And I did that for a number of years until September when I became WKBN. Mm -hmm. Also, when, I, when the merger happened, I, I got out of weather. It was just, there was a lot of things happening. They were trying to figure out how to make both stations work in one building. Mm -hmm. And it was a, we made some mistakes when we did it. And one thing mm -hmm. that decided is to make me the anchor. And so then when Paul Wetzel came in and did the weather, Chad Krasminski did the sports, and now we're both, all three of us are now together on WKBM. But anyway, the three of us were a team, and I was the anchor, and then eventually it was decided to move me over to the WKBM, report during the evening mm -hmm. news between 5 and 6 o'clock, and then I anchor the 10 o'clock on Fox and the 11 o'clock on WKBM. That's a brief synopsis. Now, your beginnings in radio, it's interesting because you know, oftentimes when I talk to somebody who's been in television, they find that their beginnings was always in radio. Is there any reason for that, or is that well, just how time, you Well, at the time, they were both so big. True. Um, and there were, the radio stations had new staffs. The mm -hmm. station that I worked for in Dayton had new staff of five, which yeah. may not sound a lot, but that was sure. pretty big for a radio mm -hmm. news staff at the time. But then they, they started weeding that out. Radio mm -hmm. stations now have become more condensed. They're only owned by so many companies, and I'm not 100% sure that there is a radio newsman in Youngstown that's dedicated only to reporting the news. Sure. I know that we, we provide some of the information mm -hmm. to, to WKBN. I know our weather people provide some of the information right. to WKBN radio. Mm -hmm. We're not even associated anymore. We're not in the same building. We're not owned by the same company. The mm -hmm. only thing that's the same is we have the same call letters. That's, yeah. uh, that, that's the only thing that, that, that's the same. There were opportunities in radio mm -hmm. at the time that I got in to do radio news. Those opportunities don't really exist anymore. It's not in Youngstown. I, I don't know about the major markets. I'm sure there sure. are still radio news mm -hmm. people in mm -hmm. New York City and Chicago. But even there, I can imagine right. the jobs are getting smaller and smaller right. all the time. You know, in your many years with television, especially with the news, what have you seen change in that regards? You know, there's obviously mergers and change in right. staff and things like that, but is there any significant changes yeah. that you've experienced that really has affected you in your life? I'm working harder now than I ever have in my sure. entire career. Okay. One of the big changes, and I, I, it really just hit me in the last couple of years. When I started, we did a six o'clock news and an 11 o'clock news. Mm. That was it right. I mean, for the entire day, the entire news mm -hmm. staff. Then they added the morning news. So they added two hours in the morning. 
We did also have a noon news every once in a while. So I take that back. There was a noon, a six, and an 11. Okay. And then we added two hours in the morning. Mm -hmm. Then we added an hour and a half at five. So now we go from five to 6.30. Right. Then they added a 10. Mm -hmm. You know, Fox came along and allowed the Fox stations to do 10. Mm -hmm. And then we started doing Saturday and Sunday morning news. So we do two hours on Saturday morning and an hour and a half on Sunday morning. So what used to be maybe an hour and a half of news a day is now eight and a half hours of news sure. a day, plus mm -hmm. early morning weekends. There, there is so much news mm -hmm. and such a demand for original content, new content. Right. They don't want to overlap what was on the six o'clock news. They don't want on the 11 sure. o'clock news because in this day and age, people have already heard right. it. So that that is the the largest change, other than the technology. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the, the, yeah. the use of technology. When I started, we used manual typewriters. Sure. Now we have you know word processors and right. computers and the internet. Right. But other than the technology, yeah. that was probably one of the major things is the, the amount of news that we do is five times more than what we did when I first started. Yeah. What about the news is so important for people to understand? I mean, you know, people just like thrive on it. They do. And, and there's a sensationalism about it there sometimes is. too. Why is that? Well, I think people thrive on it because they want information. Mm. Information mm -hmm. seems to be the one big thing. And, it, yeah. and maybe it's not just the news. People also want information if their sister is pregnant. People thrive on that. Sure. They like, and that, that's where social media, I think, has come into play. So it's not necessarily a, the president has decided today to do this type of thing. Mm -hmm. It's, oh my gosh, my cousin Julie it just graduated from college and take a look at the picture that is there. Sure. They love that kind of information. People mm -hmm. thrive on that. Mm -hmm. The sensationalism, I think, just deals with the way it's just inborn. Mm -hmm. so you can go over the top with sensational, depending on how a story right. is presented, but sometimes just in its pure manner, it would be hard not to sensationalize some of the crimes or the fires or the type of information that we pass out. Mm -hmm. Just in its own effect, it is sensational. If you were driving by and saw a huge building on fire, automatically it screams sensational, right. okay, it's in, in its own mm -hmm. way. So sometimes it's just the story is sensational, though we certainly can peek it more to, to add to the sensationalism and give it the story flavor that's there. I'm not sure. going to deny we don't, and we do that sometime as well. For more information on that topic and other related issues, and to listen to Wineskins, visit the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown at www.doy.org. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Christopher Minutes, thoughts on making every day count. Here's Monsignor Jim Lasanti. Hello, friends. Owen Bradford Butler had a knack for sales. His talent propelled him up the corporate ladder at Procter & Gamble till he became chairman of the board. But Mr. Butler believed that he should use his skills for more than just personal career advancement. In particular, he had an interest in early childhood development. Mr. Butler became a passionate advocate for children, often speaking out on corporate America's responsibility to support their development. Today, Bright Beginnings, the program he helped create in Colorado, brings an increasing number of newborns and their moms support each year. My friends, if your talents bring you success, it's important to give something back to the community. Whenever you help someone in need, you create a brighter future for them and for yourself. I'm Monsignor Jim Lasanti, Thanks for listening, and God bless you. Our song today is from the CD entitled, The Teaching of Christ. It is by the Kellenberg Memorial High School Choir. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, 
Our scripture reflection for this Sixth Sunday in Ordinary Time will be done by Father Matthew Rorig. He is a Delegate Superior of the Society of St. Paul in Canfield. We begin with a question. What minority today suffers from the oldest, the most widespread, the most humiliating, and the most crippling bigotry in human history? It's lepers. Throughout history, no sickness has been linked with more superstition, fear, and error than leprosy. Every culture, every place, every era has had an especially vivid horror of leprosy. Lepers were expelled not only from their family and community, but were almost cut off from human sympathy. Lepers were forbidden to enter cities. They had to live in the outskirts, and when they would come nearby to pick up food left behind, They had to make some noise and shout, unclean, so nobody would run into them by mistake. People didn't see leprosy as an illness. They saw it almost as a punishment from God. At the time of Christ, lepers were in a special category. Jesus tells his disciples at one point to heal the sick and to cleanse the lepers. Even today, the word leprosy strikes fear in people's minds. If we heard, for example, that a new neighbor moved in next door with tuberculosis or cancer or pneumonia, we would inquire how we could help. But if we heard that he or she had leprosy, our first reaction would be fright. We can appreciate the power in the one detail of today's gospel, where the leper cries to Jesus and Mark writes, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. He touched him. With that single gesture, Jesus reached through centuries of taboo and superstition and healed not only a disease, but also a human being. By that single gesture, he gave a lesson to his church that we are to bring the gospel to everyone, even to those shunned by others. In that single gesture, he showed that beneath every exterior is a person deeply loved by God. By that single gesture, Jesus went beyond the outward appearance to the suffering human being within. 
We are very quick to judge people by outward appearances. There is so much emphasis today on the look, the image, and how we dress. But Jesus always saw beyond that. We all have an outside and an inside. The outside is the part we show to others. But then there is the inside of us that very few people see. That is the part of us that Christ sees. Many times that is the part of us to which we don't pay much attention, but it's the part of us that is most important, the condition of our soul. That is what the healing touch of confession is all about. In the sacrament of penance, Christ touches us with his grace and gives us inner healing. He brings his spiritual medicine of grace to the scars of the soul, the wounds of sin, and the bruises of the past. That is why we should make use of the sacrament of penance often. We can spend so much time caring for our bodies that we forget about our soul. Hate, anger, and bitterness, envy and fear are real sores in the soul that we carry around. They can isolate us from others as surely as the leper's skin condition isolated him from the people around him years ago. The leper in today's gospel needed healing on the outside. We need healing on the inside. Medical science has brought under control many diseases of the body, but only Jesus can deal with the soul. Jesus gave us the power of his sacraments, the power of confession, to bring us his healing touch to a place where no doctor can operate, where no therapist can probe, where no medication can soothe, and where no friend can see. Deep within our soul, the part of us that lasts forever is the place to which only Jesus can go. For Wineskins, I'm Father Matthew Rory. Jesus reaches out and touches the leper and heals him in today's gospel. He directs the lepers to seek out the priests. In the days of Jesus, disease was linked to sin and health was linked to holiness. By his touch, Jesus made the leper healthy, whole and holy. Are you willing to show compassion and reach out to those who are considered unclean? Wineskins is made possible by the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. Wineskins is produced by CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. I'm Father Jim Corda, thanking you for being with us. Have a blessed Sunday, and may God be with you, and remember that this coming Wednesday begins a season of Lent with Ash Wednesday.